Please listen to God's word, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 1. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is, in, is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening, frightening you with my letters, for they say, His letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond, the, beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. I invite you to keep your Bibles handy, open. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures this morning and um, see where we're going as we work through this passage together. Let's pray for the Lord's blessing. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the ministry that you gave the Apostle Paul. And though we are removed by many years and by a, quite a different place and circumstance, we know that your timeless truth does never uh, return void, but will accomplish your sovereign purpose. We pray, O oh Lord, that this truth would be applicable in the way that it needs to be for each one of us individually. Lord, may you speak to our hearts, and we pray that this too, as we receive your word, would be in its own way an act of worship. As we submit to the word, as we feed on it, and are drawn closer to Christ through it, let your kingdom come and your will be done. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> what are your expectations for life, or your hopes, your dreams, what are your goals? If you could just, on half a sheet of paper, write down, what do you want out of life? What do you want to see happen? Think about the kind of things that you would be saying concerns for maybe your children or uh, concerns for your spouse, your family, your friends. Those are big questions, aren't they? Big questions get to values. They get to belief systems. They work their way down to the things that matter most to you. And those kind of questions will really get to uh, the beliefs that lie at the core of our being. These questions of hopes, goals, and expectations really get to the heart of the difference between Paul 
and the, the, the false apostles that he is contending with in chapter 10 and 11 and 12 at the conclusion of this letter. Paul must set himself apart from the false apostles, um, lest the Christians think that he is just a weaker version, a poorer version of the other apostles that have entered Corinth and have infiltrated their church. Because Paul is not a poorer or a weaker version of these super apostles, Paul is not like them at all. He is a true apostle. They are not. They are false apostles. Paul preaches a true gospel. They preach a false gospel. Paul needs to, the Corinthians to see that he's not just a weaker, watered-down version of these stellar apostles, but that he is totally contrary from them like light is from darkness. And Paul here in this passage distinguishes himself from these false apostles in a strange way, by boasting. Paul is going to boast his way into the hearts of the Corinthians. We typically think that boasting is sinful, but there is a kind of boasting that is righteous and necessary. And that's the kind of boasting that Paul here partakes of. To boast here means to take pride in. It means to put one's confidence in. And what Paul will be proud about, take pride in, what Paul here will put his confidence in, reveals to us what his hopes are, his expectations, his goals, not only for Corinth, but for the kingdom. Our theme this morning is Paul's boasting directs our attention to the ministry, mission, and majesty of Christ. Two things we see in this passage. First, Paul boasts in the authority that the Lord Jesus gave him. And then secondly, Paul here is going to boast in the Lord, in Christ himself. So first of all, Paul boasts in the authority that the Lord gave him. He feels it necessary, as we jump in at verse 7, a new paragraph, to justify the apostolic authority that the Lord had given him, an, apostol an apostolic authority that Paul had over the Corinthians. Because we saw last week the gospel is at stake. Their salvation is in peril. And he is preparing them for his visit. So he needs to reassert his authority, which the Lord Jesus gave him for their sake. The gospel is at stake. He says in verse 7, look at what is before your eyes. He's saying, look at the facts. There is a church in Corinth. There is a body of believers who trust in Christ for their salvation. Who started that? Who was the apostle who went there and broke fresh ground and preached the gospel in the Agora? It was Paul. So they're heaping all the praise on the false apostles, the super apostles, and Paul is saying, just wait a minute. It was because of me, through the Lord's grace, by his gospel, that you even exist. Consider the facts. The false apostles... And the Corinthians, who have been swayed by him, thought that Paul was unfit and ineffective and that his character was defective. And yet here they are, a believing community, nevertheless. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. Paul says here, if they say they are, false, if they say they are apostles, I also am an apostle as well. If anybody is, is confident that he is Christ's apostle, that's what is intended here, not, not merely to be uh, that he is Christ, meaning a Christian, but that he is an apostle, because that's the debate, that's the context. Who is an apostle of the Lord? And Paul here is saying, if anyone is confident that he is Christ's apostle, let him know that I am also an apostle. The false apostles doubted whether he was a spirit-empowered apostle of Christ. The false apostles are saying to the Corinthians, look at Paul, he's weak, he's ineffective, his character is defective, his speech is pathetic, he's a miserable example of an apostle. So these false apostles, and we're going to just be digging into this in the next few weeks, but they taught a triumphalistic Christianity, we'll call that triumphalism. They believed that everything should be rosy and beautiful for the Christian Christian. 
We should just walk through life on clouds. There should be no struggle at all. There's a more technical term for this. It's called over-realized eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of the end times, the last things. And an over-realized eschatology says that all the future blessings, all the future promises, all that future grace that we expect to receive in the new world should be ours today. Over-realized, like an over-baked eschatology. So Christians shouldn't suffer. right? And there are churches in our community that teach that false doctrine. If you're going through pain and suffering, it's because you don't have enough faith. That's your problem. All right, we can name names of churches that teach this error. Um, that's an over-realized eschatology. We should not be weak. We shouldn't suffer. Christians shouldn't be sick. We should have our best life now. That is the teaching of these false apostles. I think we know some people who teach that today. That's a false gospel. Paul has been contending with this already from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. From the first letter at verse 8, he says, Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. Would that we would also reign with you. And then verse 10, he says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. You can kind of hear the satire in Paul's writing. They, they had bought into this. So what we're going to see this morning as we get to the end of 2 Corinthians, we're going to be flipping back and forth to 1 Corinthians because Paul just ties this all together now. They had really bought that false teaching that we, ought, we should be rich and have honor and all these things. And Paul needs to correct that, and he does that by reasserting his authority over them. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's apostle, so also are we. He's saying if the false apostles think they are Christ's apostles, so am I. Paul says, turn to chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, verse 21. You'll see that this really then comes out loud and clear. He says in verse um, 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. So you see, this is the contest between them. Paul needs to show that he is an apostle. They say they're apostles, so is Paul, but he's a true apostle. He's a better one. He says in verse 8, For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up but not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. Paul says, you might think that I'm overreacting to this argument with the super apostles. You might think that I'm overly sensitive about my authority. Paul says, well, be that what it may, I'm not ashamed to boast of the authority that the Lord gave me. He says, I'm not going to, even though you are going to probably falsely judge me once again, Paul's just concerned about himself, sensitive Paul. Paul says, I'm not ashamed for two reasons. One, because this is the authority that the Lord gave me. And you'll notice in verse 8 how he switches names. It's always important to read your Bibles closely. He's referring that he is Christ, that he is Christ in verse 7. And then he switched from Christ to Lord. He says, I'm not ashamed because it is the Master, the King of kings, who delegated authority to me. The Lord commissioned me on the road to Damascus for this apostleship. Furthermore, he is not ashamed because his authority is for their benefit. They might misjudge him as they have a track record of doing, but he says, my authority is not for myself. They have repeatedly accused him of being self-serving, self-pleasing, but what he seeks to show here is that his authority is something not to be ashamed about because it is for building you up and not for destroying you. Look at chapter 12, verse 19. You see this comes together real tightly. Chapter 12, verse 19. He says, have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. Beloved. 
Then again in chapter 13, verse 10, For this reason I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. It's like the last word he gives before he gives his final greetings. Three times he says, my authority that the Lord delegated to me is for your benefit to build you up. Again, tying the letters together in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul loved this metaphor. He says in verse 9, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Paul here will call himself a master builder, a skilled master builder. And what is he building? The church in Corinth. Paul here alludes to Jeremiah. God, through Jeremiah, spoke of this this same metaphor of of building and of destruction. Judgment will come upon Israel because of her wickedness, and yet God in His grace will rebuild Israel. We read in Jeremiah 24, verse 6, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. That's a metaphor that the Lord uses again in Jeremiah 31 and I think 42 and 45, it's like four times where the Lord says that. You see, they thought that his authority was being used just to destroy them. Considering his emergency visit, considering his severe letter, they might feel that Paul had used his authority to destroy them. Sometimes we know that building up requires, as Paul says here in verse uh, uh, 4 and 5, Uh, It requires destroying uh, arguments, strongholds, and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Sometimes building up uh, means first clearing away clutter, destroying false doctrine, rooting out heretics. That too is part of building up. But Paul here assures them that his intent, verse 9, was not to frighten them. It wasn't to terrify them, even if he had to speak strongly. You see in verse 10, he says, here's the accusation people are saying about me. They're saying that my letters are weighty and strong, but my bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Already tied into that last week, but think about Paul's letters. You know, Paul is saying, I write to build up, and yet they just think Paul's just a, he's a bull in the china shop. He's just a battering ram. That's all he does. Think of these letters in in his first letter. He pronounced destruction on those who would destroy God's church. He pronounced exclusion from the kingdom of God, all who live unrighteous lives, and anathema on anyone who does not love the Lord. Three times in these letters, he called for judgment among God's people, and he threatened to come with a rod if necessary. He concludes his letter here in chapter 13, verse 10, which we had just read, that he is concerned that he may have to come and be severe with them, when he comes as he's approaching them already as this letter is being written and will be sent with the hand of Titus. So Paul acknowledges that there's a lot of hard, heavy truth in his letters. And he's been very strict with them. He has rebuked them. But you know, for them, that's not a very super apostle-like thing to do. It should be all commending and praising. There shouldn't be this critical A word from the Apostle. He acknowledges that they don't like his letters. They're weighty. They're heavy. They're strong. They're not fun letters. And then they also don't like his physical appearance, his bodily presence, which is weak and his speech is of no account. He acknowledges their aversion for him when he is away. They don't like his letters. And they don't like him when he's present either. When he is away, they disdain his letters and stumble over hard things. When he is present, they disdain his appearance and his speech. Uh, So maybe he had a speech impediment, but more likely he probably just did not speak like an orator. He wasn't eloquent. And he even says it in chapter 11, verse 6. He says, I am unskilled in speaking. 
So Paul was not trained in the art of rhetoric. He had a brain uh, like a computer. He was smart, but he wasn't skilled in speech. But his appearance, too, was a stumbling block. He was weak, perhaps sickly. We know that Luke uh, was a doctor and was Paul's traveling companion. So, you know, if your if you're, you're, you're general physician travels with you, you might be sickly. We have here a first century document called the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which is the closest thing we can um, deter, uh, discern to be actually a truthful statement of Paul's physical appearance. It is said in this letter that he was a man of middling size. His hair was scanty, so bald. His legs were a little crooked. His knees were projecting or far apart. And he had large eyes. His eyebrows met and his nose was somewhat long. I think you can probably picture that in your mind. Um, he's uh, not fit for the stage. So he has a face for radio. Um, that was Paul. He was everything the false apostles weren't. He wasn't cool. He wasn't suave. He didn't have a $5,000 suit. He was kind of weird, a little odd. He was a failure. Paul was a failure when he was away, and he was a failure when he was present. That's Paul. And so the false apostles are just like, who would follow Paul? And he pre his gospel, it's all about weakness and suffering. It's all about foolishness. Paul here will boast his way into the hearts of the Corinthians Boasting not in his appearance, and not in his rhetoric, and not in his knowledge, but boasting in the authority that Jesus gave him to build them up. To build them up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, I think, you know, it, it's God's timeless truth, right? Oftentimes you hear messages from, from the pulpit, you know, that might be uh, critical, that will like, convict you of your sin. It's because I seek to build you up. The elders, too, will sometimes confront you if there's a sin pattern in your life that needs to be addressed. We do that because we love you. And so the word that convicts is the same word that restores. So here's a call for us, and myself included. Be humble. Be able to receive correction. We, of course, are, are not men above the law. We, too, need to put ourselves into the word and always feel free to challenge. The, the truth is our standard, isn't it? But Christians must be able to be corrected and, and uh, convicted and, and, by God's grace, restored. Our goal and the goal of the Word is always to build you up. That's the goal. That's the mission. Paul here, Paul's boast is in the ministry and the mission and the majesty of Christ. And we're just speaking here about the ministry of Christ. His authority is for building up the body of Christ. Paul tells them in verse 11, let a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. He says we will be consistent, and we will be faithful to the task and the, the commission that God has given us. When we come, we will build you up. Words that might be severe may need to be spoken if you are proud and, and hardened in your hearts. The desire is to build you up. That's the desire of the gospel ministry. That's God's plan for you. They were the Lord's work as you and I are, and Paul was the Lord's master builder. He will boast in his authority because in so doing, he places himself in front of them as the master builder. He will build them up. He has not come to destroy them. God does that for us too through the ministry of his word. Secondly, Paul here will boast in the Lord, and we'll see that this boasting in the Lord is, is in turn a boasting in the mission of the Lord and the majesty of the Lord. Verse 12, he says with some satire, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. He says here at the beginning of verse 12, he's like, I can't begin to compare myself to those super apostles. They're amazing. I would never be as good as them. I could never speak as eloquently as them, nor could I ever be as strong and as powerful as those 
super apostles are, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with those who are comparing, commending themselves. And then in all seriousness, Paul switches, he says, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Anybody who judges himself by his own subjective standard will almost always approve of himself. A pig will consider itself the most beautiful of all animals if it compares itself to the other pigs in the pen. But put him out with the other animals and he might think differently. And even a skunk smells nice to itself. So it is with these false apostles. They praised themselves and elevated themselves on the basis of themselves. They looked in the mirror and said, I look pretty good. And they listened to their sermons and thought, I sound really nice. And Paul says, you know what? Those who judge themselves by themselves just really show how ignorant they are. They are without understanding. They are ignorant of the real standard by which our actions and our characters are judged. The standard of God, his word, his character, his righteousness. So Paul here says, you know, they're boasting in themselves, their character, their, their performance. Paul says, but I will not boast beyond limits. I will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. Paul modestly boasts in the area that God had given him to labor. Paul says that if anybody has the right to boast in Corinth, it's himself. He is the one whom the Lord has commissioned him to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He is the one who, as he says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, is their spiritual father. Jesus Christ had commissioned Paul to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Turn back a few pages to Romans 15. This is the, Paul's most lengthy treatment on this subject. Romans 15 at verse 15. He says, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Very lengthy paragraph there where Paul says, I will boast here of the work that God has called me to do, to bring the gospel to fresh territory, to new unreached people groups, to bring the gospel to the ends of the world. Paul says here, we're not overextending ourselves. What Paul here is saying is that this is what the false apostles were doing. They were overextending themselves. Not only were they boasting in their false gospel and they were boasting in their, their rhetoric and their skill and their strength, but they had waltzed into Corinth and they had hijacked the church. Paul's beloved church that he has spent 18 months starting from scratch, preaching the gospel, the true gospel to them, and then these guys come in and they hijack it. You see why Paul is reasserting his authority and why his boasting here is a boasting in the mission that Christ has given him, the ministry to build them up and the mission to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to people who have never heard it before. Paul here is not a verse to other people ministering in Corinth. That's not, Paul is not petty. He says in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians that he watered and another person come. He planted and another person came and watered. He is happy when others come, but so long as they build upon the foundation of Christ. A very unique comparison is this episode versus Philippians. So you see in Philippians, Paul is writing from Rome to the Philippians, and Paul says, some preach Christ out of envy and out of spite, seeking to do me harm. Is Paul all up in arms? Is Paul all defensive? Is Paul maintaining his... Not at all. 
Not at all. Because they're preaching the true gospel. Paul's like, I don't care if they preach Christ to spite me. Let him increase and me decrease as long as they preach Christ. But something different's going on here. They're not preaching Christ. They're preaching a false gospel. And Paul, who could otherwise be meek as a lamb, now roars like a lion. He reasserts his authority to advance the mission of Christ to unreached peoples. His hope for them is once they regain confidence in him, their apostle, in him as their apostle, their acceptance of Paul will make his, his ministry among them enlarged. Verse 13. We'll boast only in regard to this area of influence. Verse 14, we are not extending ourselves. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Verse 15, we do not boast beyond the limit in the labors of others. That's what the false people are doing. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. Paul here believes that if they can accept him as their apostle, and accept the gospel that he brings, they will be blessing themselves. They will be blessing themselves with Paul's authority, restored and regained. You know, authority, we talked about that on the radio this week, and fathers and mothers, relationships with husbands and wives, that, that authority is protective, it's protection, it's provision. And this church had been hijacked, and it needs protection from the wolves and needs provision of the true gospel. And Paul says, if you, can, if you can just step back for a moment and look at me as an apostle and look at them as apostles and judge for yourselves who is true, if you will embrace me as an apostle commissioned by Christ, you will be blessing your own hearts with the gospel that I preach. He is hopeful that they will see this, that their faith will increase. So that, verse 16, we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area of influence. Paul's writing this. He's passing through Macedonia. He'll be in Corinth in a couple weeks to a month. And um, he's already looking wistfully beyond Corinth to Rome, beyond Rome to Spain. His desire was to borrow a line from Captain Kirk, the Starship Enterprise, to go where no man has ever gone before. He wants to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. His boast is in the ministry of Christ to build up the body of Christ and in the mission of Christ to reach the unreached with the gospel of salvation. What appears to be self-promotion or a petty squabble is nothing of the sort. Paul boasts in the Lord. And that's how he summarizes it and brings it all to a, to a head here. Verse 17. We're going to boast. Let us boast in the Lord. Let us boast in Christ. That's what Paul's been doing when he's been boasting of his authority. And he's been boasting of this mission to bring the gospel to the ends of the world. It really is all about Christ, isn't it? to build up the body of Christ for Christ, to bring the message to the ends of the world so that they too might be believers in Christ. It is ultimately and always for us believers a boasting in Christ. Again, to bring all of Paul's theology together, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 31, this was Paul's passion. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord beginning his first letter, concluding his second letter, he says, this is who I am. And this is who we all should be, those who boast in the majesty of Christ. Boasting in the the ministry of Christ and the mission of Christ. And lastly, the majesty of Christ. This was the heart of gospel ministry, and it always had been. Boasting in Christ is not boasting in a vague Christ, an undefined Christ, a nameless Christ, let alone a pagan Christ, which is what the false apostles had really done. They had taken Christ and they had, they had baptized him in humanism and Corinthianism. You know, as Paul says again, going back to 1 Corinthians, but now to chapter 4, or chapter 2, verse 4, 
verse 2 rather, Paul says here, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was what they were stumbling over. Paul says, I will boast in the crucified Christ. I decided when I went to Corinth to preach an exclusive gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying in shame for sinners. And he stuck to that message. To boast in the Lord is to boast in his person, his character, his mercy, and his justice, his truth, his righteousness, his love, his compassion, his kindness, his strength. To boast in the Lord is to boast in in his death on the cross, suffering in our place as a substitute for us. We're going to celebrate that here in a second. We're boasting in his resurrection, his triumph over the grave, his defeat of darkness, crushing the serpent's head. We're boasting in the king of kings. I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking, imagining in heaven and seeing great kings who have lived and reigned on this earth who have been converted the people that we would respect with the greatest honor. And you see the kings of the world, and you see the lords of the Lord, and above them all we have the king of kings. And we have the lord of lords. We have the ultimate of the penultimate, the absolute high king of heaven. And before him the kings and lords take their crowns and lay them at his feet. That's the one we're boasting about. The one who in his own person said to humans, to the disciples, and all the fathers before them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, he said, step aside. This is my battle. This is my fight. Satan is my enemy. And I will destroy him. And you are my children and I will redeem you. We boast in His constant intercession at the right hand of the Father this very second, moment by moment. He does not cease to care for us and intercede for us. Simon, Satan asked for you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And he prays for us and intercedes for us. We boast in his spirit that he has poured out into his hearts that he is still this moment, Emmanuel, Christ with us, God here in our midst. This is our boast, the majesty of Christ. His glorious mission to bring the gospel to the farthest reaches of the earth, to convert the heathen and pagan and make those captives his own. His future is your future. His glory is your glory. We will boast in this King, this Lord, Jesus. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul criticized them for boasting in their own accomplishments. How petty, how childlike. He says, what do you have that you have not received? So quit your boasting. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Paul wants them to think again about the false apostles. Verse 18. It's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. They praise themselves. So what? Everybody can do that. They think they're great. Well, whoop de doo Any person can do that. Does the Lord commend them? Does the Lord endorse their gospel? Did Christ delegate them his authority? Think again, Paul says. Stand back and reevaluate. Exercise discernment. All that glitters is not gold. Does the Lord agree with their triumphalistic gospel, their over realized uh, eschatology? Brothers and sisters, we need to be discerning as well to tear down the strongholds and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We too might, must exercise discernment in all that we hear and uh, all that input that we have from day to day. But in conclusion, who is your boast? Our boast is Christ, isn't it? He came 
to earth for you and me. He saved us while we were yet enemies, rebels. He shed his blood for us. Does the Lord approve of you? I'm not asking if you approve of you. Are you trusting in Christ and obeying his commandments? Remember, that was Paul's passion in the first paragraph, to bring them to obedience. So it is for me to bring us all to the obedience of Christ. Look to Christ now, crucified in weakness and shame, but embedded in that weakness is the strength of God. And in that foolishness is the wisdom of God, purchasing our redemption, atoning for our sin. If anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It's a glorious thing to be a real Christian, isn't it? It's a great day to be a believer. We will boast in the ministry of Christ, which will build us up, and the mission of Christ to take the gospel to the unreached, and the majesty of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. But thank you most of all for Christ. We will boast in him. For our pride is Christ. He is our Lord and Savior. Bless us as we come to the table and nourish us with this sacrament of bread and wine. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take the forms booklet.